At long last, Notre Dame is finally going to break ground in a brand new state-of-the-art football facility in the very near future. Plus, the Irish are already making big moves in the transfer portal. That's coming right up. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome into another edition of Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Thursday, April 18th, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. I'm Tyler Wojak and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018 and now I'm a producer at Fox Sports. As always, you can watch this show on YouTube or you can listen wherever you get your podcasts. For those of you watching along on YouTube, remember to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. And for all the podcast listeners out there, please rate, review, and subscribe. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go for free on the App Store or Google Play. There's a lot to get into in today's episode. It is officially transfer portal season in basketball and football, so there's a lot of moving and shaking going on in the football portal and the basketball portal as well, so I'm going to get into all of that on today's episode. But the big news that came out on Wednesday, and it came from John Bryce from Football Scoop, who always seems to be on it with any big scoop pertaining to Notre Dame football. John reported on Wednesday that Notre Dame is finally going to break ground on a brand new all-encompassing football facility on the campus of Notre Dame here in just a couple months. The Guglielmino Athletics uh, Complex has been the home for the football program for basically the past 20 years, and it has certainly served its purpose. It was a big deal when it happened. Charlie Weiss is uh, a big person to thank in getting that off the ground, quite literally, and Notre Dame had to share that space, or Notre Dame football had to share that space with some of the other athletic programs on campus, and even though it was a really big deal at the time, it just, it's not really up to date in the arms race in college football right now. An official announcement from the school is expected to come this weekend during the Blue Gold Game festivities, and the true groundbreaking uh, is expected to happen immediately after the spring semester comes to an end, according to the report from John Bryce. So assuming that part is true, they could start as early as May 11th, and by that point, final exams are over, undergraduate halls will have closed, I think most of the final grades will have uh, been submitted by then, or they could wait until after commencement weekend, which is May 17th through 19th, but either way, the process is going to start very soon, and that's great, because this has been long overdue, if you've been listening to this podcast for a long time, or really like any Notre Dame football podcast out there, this has been a big topic of discussion, and Fans have wanted this, players have wanted it, coaches have wanted it. Notre Dame needed an update to the football facility. Now, they did make a big investment with the Irish Athletics Complex, and that is a state-of-the-art indoor facility that was also much needed because Loftus was gross. Like, when I was a student at Notre Dame, like, we would play intramural games at Loftus super late, too, because they had to share, all the athletic programs had to share the space, so they would get, you know, the reasonable hours during the morning, middle afternoon, and the evening. But if you played intramurals, especially in the winter, and you wanted to use that field, you could be playing a game as late as like 11 o'clock p.m. on a Tuesday night. But you know what? We did it and we still had fun. But now the Notre Dame football program, they don't have to share that space anymore. They've got the Irish Athletics Complex and now they're going to have their own football facility, which is a very, very big deal. The new facility is reportedly going to cost nine figures. So at the very least, it's a hundred million dollar project. That ain't cheap, man. That is a lot of money. And it's also going to be located in like the same general spot on campus by the Irish Athletics Complex and the Goog. Right now, when I'm envisioning what campus looks like, I'm kind of having a hard time picturing where exactly they're going to put it because as I understand it, the Goog is still going to exist, but I think it's going to be a shared space for the other athletic programs, not including basketball, because the men's and women's uh, teams have their own facility, a new state-of-the-art facility, at Rolf's, which uh, used to be the student rec center, but now that is reserved for the men's and women's basketball team. So this is all really exciting. I can't wait to see the pictures and everything when the school officially announces it here in the coming days. But according to John Bryce, it's going to have a quote, all new cafeteria, nutrition center, coaches' offices, team meeting spaces, media space, and an enhanced weight room, among other amenities, end quote. So this is great. It's nothing but good news. It's exciting. Uh, It's certainly great for the players, the coaches, the support staff, everyone in the program who has to use that space every day. This is really exciting for them. And I think some people 
listen to this and they're like, okay, cool. You know, new facility seems like an expensive facility though. Like, why should I care about this? Because it's not going to directly impact wins and losses on the field. You and I aren't going to be in the facility. We're not going to be spending a lot of time there, but I think it's very, very important for three main reasons. The first one being, this is another example of the university outside of the athletic department investing a significant amount in the football program. The kind of uh, the kind of investment that is absolutely necessary to compete at the highest level. Like you can have a great coach and a really smart athletic director who really cares about football, but until you get the backing from the university and specifically the funding, you're just not really going to be able to keep up uh, in college football, and what is going to happen is you're going to end up losing that coach, and you're going to end up losing that athletic director to a school that prioritizes football. And even though football has obviously been a huge, huge part of the history of the University of Notre Dame, we know that there's a little bit of a push and pull between the football program, and the athletic department, and the university trying to get all of the resources necessary to the football program for the program to really thrive in the modern era. And I think this is huge, and it shows that the school is willing to invest, and they're willing to invest a lot of money. I told you it's going to be at least $100 million. So there had to be a lot of time spent by Jack Swarbrick, Pete Bavacqua, the new athletic director, Ron Paulus as well, everyone involved in this process in getting the funding necessary to get this thing off the ground. I'm sure that it has taken years to get done, but it seems like we are finally there at the finish line. And I think whenever Notre Dame makes an investment like this in the football program, that is a huge win for all of the people involved in trying to get that done. So it's very important for that reason. I also think that it's going to make Notre Dame more attractive to recruits. Now, I've said many times in the past that there is likely never going to be a recruit who decides whether or not to come to Notre Dame solely because of the gook. Now, I think Maybe in the past, before the football facility, maybe there was a recruit who decided not to go to Notre Dame because they didn't have a facility. But I just felt like if you are making a decision to come to Notre Dame, the facilities and all the bells and whistles are probably not at the top of mind because that is not why you go to Notre Dame, nor should it be. But it's going to make Notre Dame more attractive, and I think it's going to help the cause in a big way because – say what you want, like these high school kids, when they see the flashy stuff, when they see the bells and whistles, it makes them a little bit more excited. And it's going to it's gonna be more attractive in the sense that, hey, I'm going to be going to the school. I'm going to be spending a ton of time in that facility. I'd like for it to be a really nice place. And I also think that because uh, it's going to look nicer and it's going to be just a better facility, that's going to show the recruits, hey, like we're telling you that football really matters at this school. And now the re- recruits are going to see that In the way that the facility is built, they're going to say, oh, wow, I believe them. Whereas before, you might see it and you're like, look, you're telling me you're invested in the football program, but, you know, why are all of the players sort of just bunched together in this one little meeting space to to do their homework? Like, that doesn't really seem like an investment into the guys, and that's a fair criticism, and I believe that has come up in the past because the staff and the, um, the amount of players and the amount of people involved in the program had simply outgrown the space in the Goog, and there really just wasn't enough space for everyone to use. And considering they spent so much time in there, they just needed more space, they needed more facilities, they needed an upgrade in the weight room, they needed all of, this, uh, all of these things. And speaking of the weight room, I believe that this new facility is going to lead to tangible improvements in the conditioning and the recovery of the players. We might not ever see it from the outside. It's going to be hard to detect um, for us to say, oh, like that player is in much better shape than they were before because now they have access to a better meal plan. The food that they're getting is healthier and they're not going to be enticed to say, hey, we don't really have that great of food options right now in the Goog. Why don't we go to Raising Cane's right down the street and munch on some chicken tenders, which, by the way, that temptation happens to me a lot. Maybe not so much now because there's not really any Canes close to me out here in Los Angeles, but when I was living in Kentucky and there was a Canes right down the street, every time I passed it, I had to go through the mental uh, gymnastics of like, should I get it? Do I need it? All that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen for anyone, especially college kids. And now when they're having better food options because of the cafeteria, I'm telling you, it goes a long way and it's going to reduce some of that temptation a little bit. But also, the recovery space and all the things needed uh, for that 
is also going to be a part of this. And it was actually reported a while back, once Notre Dame was able to get Lauren Lando to join the program as the new strength and conditioning coach, they had actually pitched him on this new facility before we knew an exact date when they were going to break ground or anything like that. It had not even been announced or reported at that point, but they were selling him on an updated facility because Lauren Lando knows that recovery is a major, major component. Like having a nice weight room is very important and you need to be able to train. You need to do all that. But really the biggest developments in terms of like exercise science and and everything that's come out in the past decade plus has more to do with recovery after workout, uh, after working out than the actual training part of it. So this is all great news. And I'm really excited most of all for like the players and the coaches who have to use that space all the time. And personally, I'm excited that I don't really have to talk about the the need for a new facility anymore because now Notre Dame is going to get it. They're going to be keeping up with some of the top programs in college football. I doubt it's going to have like a water slide or a putting course or any of the things like that. Some of the more ridiculous stuff that these schools throw in just because they have so much money. They're like, why not? Why not throw this in? It's going to look cool on the breakout video. But I still think that what Notre Dame does with this new facility is going to be it's, it's going to include all the necessary things, and I think it's going to lead to real results. It might not be the direct win or loss type of deal, but I think that it's going to show a serious, serious investment into this football program. And I'm sure we're going to get more details over the weekend, but honestly, I don't even need to see the pictures to know that this is a huge development for the football program, and it makes me even more excited for the future. All right, coming up next, Notre Dame lost a cornerback to Syracuse, but they might have already found his replacement from a pretty unlikely source. More on that right after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Yahoo Finance. When it comes to your financial future, you think you've done it all. You've saved, you've researched, you've invested all that you can. Now you need to take those investments to the next level by using what every financial great uses, Yahoo Finance. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. They're the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. Securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. And a comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. With a community of over 90 million users each month, their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com. The number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. I didn't mean to bury the lead, but maybe the biggest news that came out this week is that Notre Dame's starting punter, Bryce McPherson, entered his name in the transfer portal on Tuesday. Um, I'm kidding, but Obviously, it was a surprise considering that Bryce started throughout last season and was going to be the starter at Notre Dame um, this season. But McPherson is from North Carolina. He was committed to Wake Forest uh, when he was in high school before Notre Dame was able to flip him. So without any additional information, that's where I'm guessing he'll end up. But now is a good time to remind you that Notre Dame did add another specialist this offseason in addition to Mitch Jeter. They picked up Eric Goins uh, after Goins had spent seven years in the United States Army. He was even promoted to captain, but about a million years ago, a.k.a. 2012 through 2015, Goins spent four seasons at the Citadel where he served as the kicker and also punted a little bit as well. He punted 43 times in 2013 for an average of 40.3 yards per attempt. Now, that number is not great, but... It's something. It's it's good that Notre Dame has at least someone in that room that can punt. But as great of a story as it would be for Goins to go out there and be Notre Dame's starting punter and kick ass, they're going to need a punter in the transfer portal. It's convenient that um, Notre Dame is a very attractive destination to specialists, so I don't think that it's going to be that hard for them to find one. But I would have preferred that this happened in the December cycle as opposed to the spring one, just considering it's a little bit, uh, a, a little bit of a shorter window. And I feel like a lot of the best specialists have already found a new home, but you never know. Maybe just the fact that this position opened up might attract a specialist who would not have gone into the transfer portal to now make that decision so that they could end up at Notre Dame. Also, 
just given the timing of all this, I'm guessing that special teams coordinator Marty Biagi probably had some inkling that this was going to happen so that Notre Dame could start uh, preparing for this and looking out there and scouting for whoever is going to be Bryce's replacement. Also, we got some news. Talked a little bit in yesterday's show. Clarence Lewis, CPA. Um, committed to Syracuse. So good for him. He gets to be closer to home. I think he's going to have a much better chance at playing time. Also, tax season is over. So a lot of good things happening for him. He can take a break after that. And also, he can get ready for the upcoming season at Syracuse. Now, for the good news, um, Notre Dame is hosting former Rice cornerback Treshawn Devoins on campus for a visit today. Uh, this was a surprising development. I believe Matt Zenitz from 24-7 Sports was the first to report this news. And Treshawn is a good player. He's listed as six foot, 187 pounds. Um, he's a former walk-on at Rice who earned a scholarship after his freshman season. Then he missed the entire 21, uh, 2021 season due to an injury. Played a little bit in 2022, but really took off last season and had a really impressive year in his lone season as the starter. He finished the season with 45 total tackles, two interceptions, and 11 passes deflected, which is really impressive. So guys were throwing at him, but he was making plays in the ball. According to Pro Football Focus, he allowed receptions on just 59% of his targets last season, which is really good. That's an impressive number. He had the best coverage grade on the team for players eligible who had been out there for enough snaps. And what I really like about Treshawn, his potential fit at Notre Dame, is that he can play in the field or in the box. I think Notre Dame could probably use a little bit more help at nickel because I believe that Clarence Lewis was projected to back up Jordan Clark, the transfer from Arizona State. So the fact that he has some experience there is uh, definitely a benefit. However, most of his experience is playing outside on the field. So it would be an adjustment, but still, this is important because I think Notre Dame really needs uh, a replacement for Lewis. And I, I'm going to you know, be a little cautious here. I'm not going to get fooled like I did with Antonio Carter last season and project or project Treshawn Devoins as a starter because I I got a little bit ahead of myself when Antonio Carter committed to Notre Dame last year. I thought that maybe he was good enough to jump DJ Brown and be the starter opposite Xavier Watts, but that did not turn out to be the case. Um, as I understand it, Antonio Carter is still in the transfer portal. He has not found a home ever since he transferred from Rhode Island to Notre Dame, just never really made an impact in his lone year with the Irish, and now he's back in the portal and, yeah, can't find a home. But I still think that uh, Treshawn put out enough good tape last year, and also I think Rice is obviously a better football program than Rhode Island, to make the transition, if he decides to come to Notre Dame, a little bit more seamless. Um, I think my, my concern with Treshawn is that he only has – one full season as a starter. He doesn't have like a ton of experience playing on the college level. Like he's been in a college football program for a long time now. And I, I do really respect the fact that he started out as a walk on, earned his scholarship, and then tried to find a role and then finally broke out last season. But the fact that he only has that one season is a bit of a concern. But something that really stood out to me when I was looking through some of his stats here and his numbers and his background is that he actually had his best game of the season last year against Texas. And Texas had one of the best offenses in the country, especially that wide receiving core. They have two potential first-round picks in uh, A.D. Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, plus Quinn Ewers throwing in the ball. In that game, he had a career-high six tackles and only allowed two receptions on five targets for just 19 yards. So whenever you're looking at one of these players in the transfer portal who went to a smaller school and then they're trying to make that transition to a much bigger program going up against much better competition, I always try to look at what they did against um, com comparable competition, and Texas would certainly fall into that category. So the fact that he was able to do that in that game makes me more comfortable about what he could do for Notre Dame at this level. But still, I don't think he should be a starter. But um, if you really look at the, the cornerback depth right now, it's really not that great. That's without Benjamin Morrison, obviously, as he recovers from his shoulder surgery. And I still think the hope is that he will be ready to go by the start of this season. But that's not a guarantee. So if you were to remove Benjamin Morrison from the equation right now for this exercise, you've got Jane Mickey, and you've got Christian Gray. Um, after that, it, it's not that great. Like, you've got Jordan Clark at nickel, which is obviously good. But then you've got Micah Bell, Chance Tucker, unproven players. And I know you've got some freshmen coming in as well, but I don't think you want to rely on true freshman cornerbacks. So, you know, this is one of the eye-opening things that 
me and Luke realized yesterday when we were doing our blue and gold game draft, which by the way, was a ton of fun. If you haven't listened to that yet, go back, check it out. Uh, we actually learned a lot. And one of the things that we learned was that without Morrison, like there's still some talent. There's a lot of talent in that cornerback room, but the depth is being tested and Notre Dame um, needs to add in the portal to sort of make up for that. Um, you know, maybe if Benjamin Morrison did not have the shoulder surgery, I would not have felt it was such a necessity to add a cornerback in the tra- transfer portal. But given his injury and given Clarence Lewis's departure, they really need to pick up a guy at that position. I think Treshawn Devoins is like a perfect fit. If he wants guaranteed playing time, I'm not really sure that Notre Dame is the place for him because he's going to be more of a reserve player, hope, hoping uh, hopefully everyone stays healthy and he's a reserve player. But if he, if, he, if he wants to have a role on a playoff team or at least a team capable of making the playoff, Notre Dame is a perfect fit, and I think that he could have a real role this season, and I'm hopeful that Notre Dame is going to be able to get this done and get him to commit. Uh, like I said at the beginning of this, he's on campus today. I think this is his first visit, so hopefully Notre Dame is able to get a commitment for, from him before he even leaves, and uh, that would be a big-time addition for the Irish, so let's hope they get it done. All right, coming up in segment three, we're going to stay in the transfer portal, but we're going to make a jump from football to men's basketball because Micah Shrewsbury's squad just added their first big addition, and man, can this guy shoot. The Locked On NFL Mock Draft is available now. Find the ultimate six-episode series on Locked On NFL Draft to hear who the local Locked On experts are picking for every NFL franchise with live reactions from local college football experts as well and even a fantasy football angle. The Locked On NFL Mock Draft is available now on Locked On NFL Draft on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by Monopoly Go. We've all been there. Either as a player or a fan, it's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low. Not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up, and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heist, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches in the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. You can charge other players rent for your iconic properties. And you can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb that leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play. All right, we got some news in men's basketball as well. Former forward Kerry Booth officially committed to Illinois over the past couple days. And look, I know that Kerry Booth said in his announcement when he entered the transfer portal that he was considering coming back to Notre Dame, but that was never really an option. And as I said before, when he first put his name in the portal, this is a big loss for Notre Dame because Kerry Booth was one of the foundational pieces for the Micah Shrewsbury era. And he was one of the few big men that Notre Dame had that I felt would be really promising. And you really started to see those flashes from Kerry Booth at the end of the year. Like it did take him a while to get there. He came off the bench for the first 11 games of the season, but then he started to figure it out at, at the end. And then you think, man, with with Booth and Braden Shrewsbury and Marcus Burton leading the charge here. The future is bright with this group. But now he's gone. He's with Illinois. Wish him the best of luck. But Notre Dame was able to add their first addition in the transfer portal yesterday in former Princeton guard Matt Alaco, excuse me, when he committed to Notre Dame and he picked the Irish over his hometown Ohio State Buckeyes. That was a big get because uh, Matt is from a suburb around Columbus, and I think a lot of people expected him to go to Ohio State, but nope, he's going to join Michael Shrewsbury in the Notre Dame men's basketball program, and I really, really love this addition. He's 6'4", 197 pounds, and he's a two-time All-Ivy League performer. This past season, he scored 12.5 points per game and added 6.9 rebounds per game as well, which is really impressive for a guard. And Princeton is a good team. Like, they've obviously got a lot of history, but they finished 24-5 and uh, and 12-2 and in the Ivy League last season. And uh, Matt Alaco is a big reason for that. He was second in the conference in assist to turnover ratio as well, so he's really good at protecting the ball, which is Definitely something that Notre Dame struggled with last season. But what I think is most impressive about him is that he's a 50-40-90 player, which means that last season he shot over 50% from the field, over 40% from three, and over 90% from the free throw line. Like, this dude can shoot the lights out. He finished uh, 50.8% from the field. He shot 40 or 0.427% from three, which is 
such a good clip and also shot um, 90.9% from the foul line last year in 91 career games. He averaged 9.2 points per game, 3.5 rebounds per game, and 2.3 assists. And he also shot 48.4% from the floor and over 40% from three. Notre Dame men's basketball definitely needed some veteran help. Last season, it was like watching a bunch of high school kids at some points because that's basically what they were. Notre Dame was running out a lot of true freshmen, and they were figuring out how to play college basketball on the fly. And boy, did it show during the early parts of that season. Those are some pretty tough games there. Um, But they were able to figure it out a little bit at the end. And I think that adding a guy like Matt Alaco provides some veteran help, Some just, just a guy who's old, He's been around. He's seen a lot of college basketball. He understands the modern game. And like I said, he can shoot the lights out. And that is something that Notre Dame could not do last season. They finished 289th in the country in three-point field goal percentage at uh, 31.8%, which is, it's bad. Like, I knew it was bad watching it, but when you really look at the numbers, you're like, damn, there's 288 teams who shot it better from three than Notre Dame last season? Well, that's the truth. But I think that by adding a guy like Matt Alaco, that that number's going to go up a lot next season. Plus, you got to hope that Marcus Burton is going to figure out his shot at some point. He was like around 30%. Uh, and then Brayden Shrewsbury got it going at the end of the year, but it took him a while to get there. So they have Shrewsbury. They've got Alaco now, two really good shooters. And This is exactly what every single team in modern college basketball needs. You need a guy who's old. You need a guy who you can trust. And you need a guy who's been there before. So these are all great things for Notre Dame. And I think that, you know, this is this is a good step in the right direction for the men's basketball program, but they still got some work to do, uh, especially with the loss of Kerry Booth. Basically, they need the big man version of Matt Alaco, someone who's played a long time and has the stats to show that he can play at a high level. Um, so I'm sure that Micah Shrewsbury is doing a lot of work to get that done and find another veteran who is reliable um, in the post. But Notre Dame has 11 scholarships players at the moment so they've got some room to add I think this is a good first step and I think that Matt is going to be a if he's not a starter next season uh, I think he will be he will certainly be a key guy off the bench and I I feel like no matter what happens he's going to end up playing a bunch of minutes every game and he's going to be a huge piece and hopefully he can be a bit of a mentor for Marcus Burton uh, Marcus Burton Brain Shrewsbury and the young guys on this roster because this is a guy that Notre Dame needs and it's the type of player that Notre Dame could not add last season because what grad transfer wanted to be a part of that debacle? No one, right? That's why Notre Dame didn't add any. But now they're starting to um, get the message out that, hey, Notre Dame's for real. They're serious about men's basketball. And Micah Shrewsbury has this program heading in the right direction. So great first step. I'm hopeful they can add more. And if and when they do, you know that we'll have you covered right here on Locked On Irish. But that is going to do it for today's episode. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. Remember to get those mailbag questions in. We're doing a mailbag on Friday. You can drop your questions in in the YouTube comments, or you can send them on Twitter at Lockdown Irish or on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod. Don't forget, subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.